Hi guys, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. I'm here in uh, Colorado, and uh, we don't have very good service here, so you're going to have to bear with me. This might be a bit of what we would call a potato quality stream. So uh, yeah, it's not going to be the best quality. I'm running like, if you saw the mess of cables running right now, it is hilarious. I'm trying to run like an aggregate between like wi-fi and hotspots and literally plugging into ethernet and i'm sitting on the floor so this is going to be a special edition <laughs> a special edition breckenridge mountaintop uh yeah it'll be good it'll be good so um i assume it's pretty potatoey, but you know well we're doing our best so let's start off like we always do here this is our pre-launch preview today spacex is launching the iridium 8 satellite and uh, this is the last of the Iridium launches, unfortunately. Uh, boo, because these have been really fun launches. Iridium is an awesome company uh, providing global internet, which is pretty awesome. Um, ooh, it sounds like the SpaceX live stream is actually up already. Okay, let me know if that's... Also, I'm doing this all totally mobile, so let me know if like audio levels and stuff are, are good or bad. Um, I'll fly through this here real quick then. So, um, yeah, this is taking off here in about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. Um, this is the Iridium communication satellite, the 10th of these. There's 64 satellites altogether. Um, this is going to be a Block 5 Falcon 9. Um, this is the second time this particular core is flying. So this is going to be um, 1049.2. So the dot .2 means it's the second flight of this particular Falcon 9 booster. 
So just remember, anytime you see a period nowadays, we have to like, you know, we have to actually like put it in the name how many times this booster's flown. I just think that's absolutely awesome. Um, yeah, so this is 1049.2. I believe it first flew, oh, I already forgot. Um, yeah, this is launching out of Space Launch Complex 4E out of Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Um, the total payload, this is actually pretty heavy, 9,600 kilograms, but it's only going to low Earth orbit, a polar orbit, so it doesn't require, you know, this isn't, a Falcon 9 would probably not really be capable of sending something this big uh, up to geostationary transfer orbit. But to, uh, to low Earth orbit, to polar orbit, no big deal. So um, they're going to be, they will be attempting to recover the first stage on the drone ship. Um, they are not, uh, they are not attempting to recover the fairing, unfortunately, even though SpaceX has been practicing, and I'll pull up that video here in a second, which is really cool. But this is the 67th flight of a Falcon 9 rocket, the 33rd uh, landed attempt, um, the 19th reflight of a first stage booster. This is becoming so normal. We're getting to the point where it's almost, what, a third of all launches are on a reflown, uh, reflown rocket from SpaceX. Literally two years ago, that wasn't even a thing. So that's just unbelievable. Super, super, super cool. So, and of course we have this wonderful image here from, um, from Jeff Barrett showing you everything you need. So whenever you need to know what's coming up, what's gonna happen on this upcoming mission, anything you need to know on missions, just head on over to everydayastronaut.com slash prelaunch preview, and you'll get everything you hopefully need to know. Let us know if there's anything missing. Um, but we kind of are constantly updating it. Sorry if SpaceX is a little too loud. Again, this is a completely mobile setup. I am sitting crisscross style for this live stream, so hopefully my Zen is aligned. I don't know what that means. All right, let's go. Keep going on to. Uh, I want to show you guys what has been awesome with SpaceX. Is they have been busy. I think we know what I'm going to talk about right away. Look at this. Starship test flight rocket just finished assembly at SpaceX. This is not a rendering. This is the actual picture. Ah. Yeah, I mean, come on, right? Is this not about the single coolest thing you've ever seen in your life? Oh, here, I can pull up the countdown clock for you guys too. Yeah, so we are 16 minutes away for those asking. Yeah, I think that's about the coolest thing ever. I cannot wait to see this thing hop. Elon has been talking a ton about, you know, giving us a lot of detail. It's almost like been an AMA, a Reddit AMA style over Twitter lately. He answers so many things. It's so cool. So. Um, so yeah, it's, I think this is pretty exciting, but the other thing that's really exciting, they, they finally released a really cool video of them attempting to catch a fairing. Watch, we got to watch this cause this is awesome. So this is the, the best we've really seen so far, um, of how they do this. Ooh, the lives, we'll get back to that in the coast phase. How about that? Meanwhile, time to watch. Ooh, Four, three. a little different intro. All right. I'll swap this out guys. mission. You are looking at a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket on the pad at our Vandenberg Air Force Base launch site as we prepare for liftoff a little over 15 minutes from now. Good morning from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. I'm John Isbrucker, the Falcon Principal Integration Engineer, and I'd like to welcome you to the webcast of the Iridium 8 mission. Yes. And a particularly special welcome to CEO Matt Desch and the nearly 250 Iridium guests who made the trip out west to watch today's launch. Sweet. This is the final in a series of eight launches for our customer Iridium to build their new satellite network, Iridium Next. Our first launch for Iridium was the Iridium One mission, which took place on January 14, 2017, almost two years from today. Now on this final mission, we're flying 10 Iridium Next satellites to join the 65 satellites previously placed in orbit by SpaceX. Today's launch is scheduled for 7.31 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, or 15 hours, 31 minutes Universal Time. Now, as you can see on the timeline bar at the bottom of the display, this is a long mission. Today's webcast will last over an hour. Now, following stage separation, we'll be attempting recovery of the first stage on our West Coast drone ship just read the instructions. Now for the music fans out there, 
Iridium has curated another special Spotify playlist to go along with today's launch. To play along at home, search for the Iridium 8 Launch Soundtrack playlist and get ready to start the playlist at exactly T minus 12 minutes and 55 seconds before liftoff, just about 30 seconds from now. So guys, friendly reminder, I am literally in the middle of the mountains here. So unfortunately, we're doing the best we can as far as output. Uh, it looks like we're going to be stuck at 720 today just to make sure we actually get something out. Um, yeah. Um, uh, it's just past sunrise at our launch site, Space Launch Complex 4 East at Vandenberg Air Force Base, a place where I worked years ago flying Titan 3s. Now it's just a few hours up the coast from our headquarters here in Hawthorne, California. Now on the screen you can see the two-stage Falcon 9 vehicle on the path. It stands 70 meters tall. That's over 21 stories in height. Now the first stage will provide the initial force to get Falcon 9 out of the majority of Earth's atmosphere. Now you can see in the first stage the soot. That indicates that this booster has flown before. It previously supported the Telstar 18 Vantage mission in September out of Cape Canaveral. So today will be the second flight of that first stage. Now about two and a half minutes into flight, the first and second stages will separate. That happens right at the joint between that black part of the rocket and then the white second stage up at the very top. Once that happens, the first stage will be coming back. We're attempting to land the booster out at sea on our drone ship located about 250 kilometers downrange. Now from there, we'll follow the second stage as it takes the 10 Iridium X satellites from the edge of space to their intended orbit. Now we'll see the first shutdown of the second stage. Then we're going to have a 43 minute coast phase before we relight the engine for a short burn and that will then lead up to deployment of the Iridium satellites. Now those satellites are currently housed at the top of the rocket. You can see in the close up the 17 foot diameter payload fairing with the Iridium Next 8 logo on it. Now for those of you who are wondering, there's no parachute on the fairing on this mission. So we won't be attempting fairing recovery this time around. But there still is a lot going on for this flight. Finally, the structure you can see, that truss structure next to the Falcon 9 rocket in white, that's the transporter erector. It carries the rocket from the hangar to the pad, and at about T minus 15 hours, it raised it to the vertical position. That erector carries the plumbing and the electrical systems that are routed to the Falcon 9 and the Iridium satellites. Shortly before launch, at about T minus four minutes, that erector will move 13 degrees away from the rocket. That's a little different than our East Coast launch pads that move away at liftoff. Sweet. Uh, I still am seeing a lot of the same questions. Yes, unfortunately. I'm not actually sick. Uh, I'm just up at like 3,000 meters in altitude. Went from sea level to 3,000 meters in altitude in Breckenridge, Colorado. And that just does a number on like my sinuses and like congestion and head. So I'm, I'm okay. I don't, I'm not actually sick, but it's just like all this stuff is, uh, is yeah, is bleh. And, and also that means I don't sleep for some reason. That first minutes, night. 10 minutes, 15 seconds, counting down. And as I like to report on the webcast, the good news, team is working no issues on the rocket. Falcon 9, we began loading propellants at T minus 35 minutes. Currently, the second stage fuel tank is fully loaded with RP-1 kerosene. Fueling is still going on on the first stage. That'll finish about six minutes before launch. Liquid oxygen loading is underway on both the first and the second stage right now. Now our next major activity coming up in just under three minutes is opening the valves between the first stage propellant tanks and the engines. That allows us to chill the turbo pumps prior to the ignition sequence that starts in the last couple of seconds of the countdown. On the customer side, the Iridium team has transferred to internal power at T minus 15 minutes. They're reporting no issues. They're monitoring the satellites, but they are ready for launch at 31 minutes after the hour. Today we're operating out of Vandenberg and flying over the Western Range. We get similar support for our Eastern Range launches. Today the Air Force is giving us clearance of both the air and the sea space and they are providing weather support, launching the balloons we need to understand what's happening at the upper altitudes. And speaking of the weather, 
We all talk about it, but we only can <laughs> wait and watch what happens with it. Currently, the upper altitude looks good. We are watching ground winds at the lower altitude at the launch pad site. I've been looking at that on my telemetry plot. We had a peak a little bit earlier, but the wind seemed to be dying down a bit. But we're going to be watching that, especially as we retract the erector about four and a half minutes from now. But currently, the weather looks like it's cooperating. Now, in order to correctly position the satellites, the SpaceX team has to launch right on time. So therefore, today's launch window is instantaneous. If we delay for any reason, we do have a backup opportunity tomorrow at 7.25 a.m. Pacific time. Sweet. Yes. So uh, Vandenberg, of course, this is like the, the clearest I've ever seen Vandenberg. This looks gorgeous. So to all the rocket photographers out there, you guys look like you're lucking out today for once because normally it's like just straight up Foggenberg. And uh, yeah, uh, I'll, to all you, uh, of you remember from ooh. our previous webcast, Iridium operates a network of 66 satellites in low Earth orbit. Now, including today's flight, we will have sent up enough satellites to replace the original 66 plus an additional nine in orbit spares for a total of 75 Iridium Next satellites. Now in space, each Iridium Next satellite is cross-linked to four other satellites. That creates a dynamic mesh network that provides coverage over 100% of the Earth's surface. This network allows Iridium to deliver high-quality mobile voice and data coverage to the most remote edges of the planet, from the north and south poles to the oceans and the airways. Iridium Next significantly enhances their ability to meet the growing demand for global mobile communications. Let's learn more about Iridium Next. Perfect, because I see people asking what Iridium is. So here you go, this is gonna be a nice. It's about staying connected to your friends, your family, your business. Every generation has made their contribution to strengthening these connections. In the 1990s, the drive for truly global connections began with a vision that was as bold as it was audacious. The founders of Iridium set out to create a global network of satellites that would revolutionize communications, allowing people to connect to data, devices, and each other from anywhere on Earth. The first Iridium service launched in late 1998. Yet like earlier communications, Iridium's original satellites needed to be refreshed to keep up with a growing and evolving demand. Iridium embarked on a $3 billion replacement of its global network. With a total of 66 operational satellites, this feat represented the largest technology refresh in history. Now, the countdown to Iridium's eighth and final launch begins. With this launch, Iridium will once again bring their initial bold and audacious vision to life. Because at Iridium, they know connections matter in every area of life, in ways we see and in ways we don't. That is the driving force behind Iridium partnering with the best companies throughout the world to enable the most innovative services and solutions possible and imaginable. It is their unwavering commitment to creating the most powerful multi-service broadband platform. Already... All right, I feel like while they're still talking about this, I better, I better answer a few questions. Yes, all of these Iridium satellites go up into a polar orbit. Um, the old generation of satellites are currently being deorbited or at their end of their lifespan, they will just deorbit. They're in, a, they're in a low Earth orbit, so they can't last very long anyway. But unfortunately, well, kind of fortunately, maybe unfortunately, these new satellites will not do an iridium flare. They don't have the big reflector or the same reflective quality that the old iridiums did. They used to be able to easily see them across the sky. T minus four minutes, 10 seconds, and we are continuing to count down for an on-time launch. We're currently pressurizing the second stage. We are opening up the clamp arms on the strongback and getting ready to recline away from the Falcon 9. 
That process will take about a minute. As you can see on the screen here, we're getting ready to move away. We have completed fuel loading on the first stage. We're continuing to load liquid oxygen on both first and second stage. That'll wrap up between T minus three and T minus two minutes. You can see now in the close up the strong back moving away about 13 degrees from the rocket to get into the launch position. Now, as a reminder, at about 90 seconds before launch, we drain the propellants out of the lines that are in the erector. And when we do that, the liquid oxygen that we vent overboard will combine with the moist Vandenberg air. And you may see and hear a large white uh, cloud come off the erector. That's normal. We expect that every time. Now, the Falcon 9, as I said, they're looking good, working no issues. The Iridium team, they are ready to go. The range reports that everything looks clear for launch. And the weather has continued to cooperate. The ground Stage winds one, are high, but it looks like we're within limits. But we're going to be watching those all the way in the last few minutes here. But right now, everything looking good for an on-time launch just after 31 minutes after the hour. Now, as a reminder, we have a backup launch window. If anyone calls hold, 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 that backup is tomorrow, about five minutes earlier than today. But for now, everything looking good. We're going to listen and watch on the final minutes of the countdown of Falcon 9 with Iridium Next. Okay, so friendly reminder, this is an instantaneous launch window. So we have literally, there's one second where they, they have to have everything ready to go. And if there happens to be a gust of wind, literally at that one second, if, if that, trigger, that could trigger an abort, and we'll be right back in the same place here tomorrow. So hopefully, you know, they're, they're watching it. Obviously, the computer watches it. Um, and... Looks like everything's good to go. And don't forget, out here at Vandenberg, this is the old strong back retractor. So it's, it sits there and goes about 77 and a half degrees, I believe, and just stays there. So it won't do that quick retract back like they do um, on the East Coast. So this is a West Coast launch, old strong back. Um, yep. Two locks load I better get now. to some of your guys' uh, super chats. Thank you. I've, uh, I, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Val Valdemir, thank you so much from Denmark. And Derek, who needs Diablo 2 when there's a rocket? That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Derek. Oh, and you've been listening to our Ludicrous Future podcast. Thank you. That's been a lot of fun. I've had a ton of fun doing our Ludicrous Future. That's been, if you guys aren't subscribed and or listening to the podcast that I do with Joe Scott and Ben Solens from Teslanomics, definitely check it out. It's called Our Ludicrous Future. And Zane, I, I'm sorry if I do look tired. I don't know what it is about the first day in mountains, like the acclimation. Like I drank so much water, just chugging water, trying to like stay hydrated and stuff. And despite that, I slept terribly. So hopefully uh, a nap is probably in, in store for today. So um, let's see. And John, uh, God, wonder if I've heard of Arca. That's a good, I've actually mentioned them really quick in a, um, in a, the Rocket Lab video I produced a few years ago, um, or last year about this time. And they're in that same kind of class as, as Rocket Lab, but they are very interesting. Yes, they're working on a single stage to orbit vehicle one, with an aerospike engine. And, ooh, yes, Falcon 9 go for launch. That is good news. So here we go, guys, we're 30 seconds out. Um, but yeah, to be perfectly honest, uh, I, I need to look more into the company, but they've had some, a few, interesting things in their history that makes me um, a little bit skeptical about some of their claims. So I'll, I'll wait to see more about that. Um, and then someday I would love to, and yes, minus 15 seconds. it does look like their, <laughs> it does look like their aerospike is made out of styrofoam Nine, and it could eight, be. Here we go. Seven, six, five, four, three. Water two, deluge, ignition. One. Ignition. Yes. Yes. Good stuff. Oh, that's pretty. Vehicles pitching downrange. I love it. Stage one props nominal. Oh, look at that. Already going crazy fast. Wow. So once it gets to a thousand kilometers an hour for those of us. 40 oh. seconds and Falcon 9 is on its way with a countdown of the last 10 seconds by Iridium CEO Matt Desch. Oh, We're I didn't realize that. throttling down now in preparation for the period of maximum dynamic pressure. Vehicle supersonic. 
That's so crazy. That gets... Countdown one, first motion time, 15, colon 31, colon 33, decimal 492, UTC. Calling out the time there of liftoff over the so net. Position of signal. Hold We're on. through the period of maximum dynamic Three, pressure. Maximum aerodynamic pressure. Merlin engines continuing to perform at 1.7 million pounds of thrust. Falcon 9 heading out into the upper atmosphere. Yes. So, yeah, we're already nice about from the first stage camera looking aft. Over 60,000 feet for those of us metrically impaired. Air Force Base, Space Launch Complex for East. Twice as high as an airliner. The MVAC engine cheer call out indicates that we have now opened up the oxygen that goes to the pump on the second stage engine, chilling it down for ignition coming up about a minute from now. Oh, that's such a pretty shot. Look how pretty Earth looks right now. And of course, you'll notice Hearing that the engines. Call outs, propulsion looks nominal. The trajectory looks good. Of course, you'll notice now the engines. Up will Dang it, be sorry. Rapid fire events. Main engine cut off. We shut down the nine Merlin 1D engines. At two and a half minutes, we will separate the stages. We'll light the second stage engine. And at just a little bit after that, we'll relight three engines on the first stage to begin slowing it down for landing in the Pacific Ocean on our drone ship. Sweet, here it comes. Engine cutoff. No more smoke. Stage separation confirmed. Good stage set. All right. Look how quickly that first stage is flipping around. Stage one is under its foot. They're doing a boost back burn. So we've had successful shutdown of the first stage. I think. It's separated. It's doing the flip to reorient, and it's lit its three engines to begin slowing it down to come to the drone ship. Meanwhile, on the right-hand side of the display, second stage engine has ignited, begin propelling the Iridium satellites. You can see them there as we get ready for fairing separation. Fairing set, fairing separation looks good. Confirmed. This stage shut down. A lot of events happening. You saw the fairing separate, and you can see one half of the fairing drifting away behind the second stage on the right-hand side of the display. On the left side, we've had shutdown from the boost back burn, and you can see the titanium grid fins slowly extending. That's nominal for those grid fins. The yep, white flashing you see, that is attitude control gas, nitrogen that's used to orient the first stage. Yeah, so remember in CRS-16, we saw them open up slowly. That is normal for these titanium grid fins. They do open up really slow, like substantially slower than those old aluminum ones. They're a lot heavier. It's just an entirely different mechanism, so. We're coming up four minutes into flight. In about a minute and a half, the first stage will initiate a quick re-entry burn to again slow the rocket down as it re-enters Earth's atmosphere. A minute later, we'll perform the final burn, the landing burn, which will decelerate the vehicle to a gentle landing atop our drone ship. Just read the instructions. Now as a reminder, recovery is always a secondary objective to our primary goal of delivering our customer's satellites to orbit. Mm -hmm. Views you have right now, the camera on the left is looking up the inner stage where there used to be a second stage. Now we're looking at the grid fins with the Pacific Ocean in the background. Meanwhile, on the right-hand side, the MVAC-D second stage engine running about 200,000 pounds of thrust in the vacuum of space. You can see the nozzle glowing red hot. That's nominal for that nozzle. Yes. So they did a, a slowdown about burn. Half so a minute away from the entry burn. This one will also be a three engine burn. That will slow the vehicle down as we go to subsonic speeds and then eventually a final burn a little bit after that to land on the drone ship. So notice that the telemetry in the top right hand of the screen is showing us the first stage. So it's actually decreasing Getting in altitude. Excellent views as the sun has risen recently over the west coast here in the United States. And it's increasing in velocity. So now we're gonna we're gonna gonna see the velocity slow down probably about in half as it goes through that reentry burn here in a second. Um, and and don't forget. Um, oh, here we go. There's stage entry burn ignition. Entry burn has started. Call out the entry burn on stage one has started. So it was at 4,500 kilometers an hour or so. Up and running. Down to about 3,000. So it bled off two-thirds of its velocity. 
And, and notice that it pitched over. Down, called out over the countdown net, as you heard. Stage one FTS is safe. So did you notice it pitched over? The first stage maneuvered so that it can start to produce a little bit of a, a dog leg. And, and by coming in a little bit sideways. First stage entry burn has ended. We're less than a minute until the third and final landing burn, followed by touchdown on the drone ship. And you can see the first stage descending back down through the atmosphere as it's coming up on the cloud deck. Now, as a reminder, we may lose live video hey, coverage on the drone ship as the engine exhaust degrades the radio frequency signal. Now, if that happens, we'll share status updates on the first stage as they become available. So, um, the more they pitch over, the more... AOS. Drone ship AOS means Ooh. the drone ship has acquired the signal. I'm nervous after that CRS-16 one. Everything's looking good, though. Man, those grid fins move Center fast. Center engine has lit. We're slowing ourselves down, Look preparing at that. to find the drone ship right underneath us. You've got the camera view from the drone ship now. Come on. <laughs> Waiting to see the first stage come into view. Yes, this looks good. This and looks we're good. Getting the signal drop out, which is not unusual. This looks good. We're gonna keep pressing on. We have not heard confirmation. <laughs> Here we go. Yes. Good. Yes. There you go. We heard the call out from Recovery. Falcon 9 has landed. We hope to get a shot of it on the deck of the drone ship a little bit later. But we can confirm we're down with the first stage. We're pressing on on the second stage mission. Currently, trajectory looks good. We've begun throttling down the Merlin vacuum engine, maintaining the G-load on the Iridium Next satellites. Sweet. That was awesome. The second stage will cut off here soon, too. So it's just getting itself up into a parking lot. Oh, they must have a video feed now. And we've got yes. the view back from this drone ship. There it is, right in the middle of the bullseye. The first stage is back again down on Earth. Meanwhile, second stage is getting ready in less than 20 seconds for shutdown and entry into the parking orbit. I love it. Every time still, guys. That is so... And they are not attempting a fairing recovery today, unfortunately. We'll talk about that here in the, in the coast phase. All right, coming up on second stage cutoff, probably any second here, right there. Coming up there on is. shutdown of the second stage engine, and we've had shutdown. In fact, shutdown. Now we're going to wait for the guidance officer to give us a report on the orbit. Insertion nominal. What's the signal Hawthorne is expected? Looking up right now. Nominal orbit insertion. It sounds like we have a good Sweet. orbit insertion. Looking at apogee, perigee, inclination, everything's looking good. So we're nine Sweet. and a half minutes <laughs> into flight. We've got a satisfactory parking orbit. We're now going to go Oops, into a coast bird. phase. This is about a 43 minute period while we coast over to Africa, where we will then relight the upper stage engine and then eventually deploy the 10 Iridium X satellites. So we're going to halt live commentary right now. We're going to take a break. We'll be back, though, at T plus 50 minutes to continuing coverage of the Falcon 9 mission for Iridium 8. Sweet. All right. And that's why we come here, ladies and gentlemen. Let me know how the audio levels are. All right. So we got a lot of you talking here. Um, let's see. Arca, we talked. So, yeah, Arca, we'll see. Um, I'm waiting to see more more from them, then maybe I'll do a video about them in the near future, direct, just only about them, because they are, as as far as I know, they're the only ones actually pursuing any kind of linear aero spike uh, for an operational vehicle, and not only that, a single stage to orbit vehicle. I'm actually going to turn this off. I don't have off volume control. Um, oh, but <laughs> you guys need this. This is my microphone. Oh, good job, Tim. So, all right, where else are we? Um, Footy23, what do you think of the Starship Hopper? Uh, when do I think the water tower is going to make its first hop? Well, it sounds like the, the Raptor engines currently on the vehicle are like a blend of mock-up slash um, previously tested parts. So I think they're just kind of fitment tests. It sounds like 
um, in about two to three uh, or four to eight weeks right now, we're expecting them to actually bring out the, the oh, let me change this, by the way. Here we go. Uh, so in four to eight weeks, it looks like they're going to be doing the radically redesigned rappers, Raptors, which I don't know what that actually means. There's been a lot of speculation. A lot of people are assuming that that might mean like the dual expansion nozzles on the Raptor engines. Um, but I'm just kind of waiting to see. Uh, once those are ready to go, that's when we'll start seeing that thing hop. Um, and it's going to be just very low key, very, um, you know, they'll literally start off at like two meter hops. Then they'll go up to like 10 meter hops and 30 meter hops. Actually, why don't we pull up, um, Elon tweeted about this yesterday, um, quite a bit actually. So we got a, a decent amount more information or let me finish the comments and then we'll go back to talking about Starship Hopper. Cause I do have that video that came out two days ago or three days ago or something, um, about why SpaceX's latest rocket, um, won't go to space. And I got a lot of, a lot of you didn't like that title, but, uh, I guess, I'm, I learned a lesson that clickbait apparently can just mean, I always thought like, to me, I always thought like clickbait meant like in like false, like that it's completely fake. And my title was 100% factually accurate. So I didn't realize that people would, uh, um, that people would not like that. But I thought it was pretty cheeky because it's like, it's not going to space. It's just a hopper. But um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I hope I didn't ostracize my audience too much. I thought it'd be funny, but yeah, we'll see. Oh yeah, we don't need the, the countdown clock anymore, do we? Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, so rap, radically redesigned Raptor. Yeah, we'll talk more about Starship Hopper in a second. Um, but meanwhile, that video that I produced this week is still very accurate, very on point. So um, yeah, isn't that funny? Some people, yeah, I mean, I don't... I don't get, I, I, never, I don't understand. I've never had like the rage of clickbait myself. Like I've never been like, oh my gosh, they, darn it, clickbait. Like when did that happen? When is it that people just have like, literally can't handle a provocative title? I didn't realize that, yeah. I, so I won't do that in the future because I got a lot of people mad at me. So, um, ooh, sorry to Rubik fan one. You did miss the launch and the landing, but we're in the coast phase right now. Um, so in about 30 more minutes, we'll see a little more action. So, all right. So let's keep answering these questions. Well, thank you, Ian. Uh, I really like what I do. I wouldn't be doing this without you guys. So thank you guys for always joining me and saying hi. Um, Craig Clausen, why does it always sound like they, they broadcast from a bu buffet restaurant? Thanks for always doing these. You're exactly right. They're literally on top of their cafeteria. And it is shocking to me that they haven't made a studio like a, a soundproof studio that overlooks that area, I, I can't believe it. Because as perfectionistic as Elon Musk is, I can't believe he's okay with there being like cutlery noises constantly happening in the background. Um, I don't know, like a cool video booth, you know, I don't know. I'm sure there's a reason. This could be uh, our Little Cruise Future's next episode of Why Don't They Just? Um, but yeah. So let's, let's keep going. Um, Brandon, thank you. I love your videos and passion today. I'm signing up to be a Patreon. Well, thank you, Brandon. I think you'll find our, our Discord channel is like growing like a weed, super active. I'm in there all the time. Literally, I'm there every, all the time when I'm working and stuff. Uh, you get exclusive benefits by doing so. So thank you for considering that. That's awesome. That really means a lot. Um, that's why I'm able to like... You guys are the reason that I'm still able to do a live stream like this, even though I know it's potato quality. I do apologize, but I have like a separate portable monitor set up and everything. So I can do launches like almost anytime, anywhere, hopefully. Um, and that's thanks to you guys. All, all the money that comes in through Patreon, I, I buy better equipment. I buy better cameras. I buy better microphones. Uh, I travel and try to get it out to rocket launches. I try to get out to, you know, SpaceX and all these other things. And it's, and it's thanks to you guys. I literally couldn't do it without you. So thank you very much. Um, Joel H. Thank you. John Regal. Love these sats. Your wife and I have an in-reach communicator for backpacking the mountains. Any idea if the new sats service the old hardware? That's a really good question, John. I don't honestly have any idea, unfortunately. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I... I don't actually know what hardware is required to use this new constellation, but um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe I'll look into it. Um, let's see. All right, let's keep going here. Uh, enables drink Gatorade. Yes, I know. I 
Drink break Gatorade Power Powerade will fix the altitude sickness. Yeah, I already chugged like two Gatorades too. I I don't know what it is about altitude in me. We do not get along very well, especially like sinuses. Just ugh. Yeah, but thank you. I will. I'll take care of that. Um, Julian's lab just programmed today iridiumware.com to see all iridium stats at once. Really cool to see them all. Can't wait to, to add the new ones. That's really cool, Julian's lab. Great work. I'm excited to check that out. Iridiumware.com. That's really cool. Is there a way to know uh, when there are going to be potential flares based on that? Because that'd be really cool. Um, let's see. John Nash. Watching your channel about a year ago, I had lost interest in space after the space shuttle stopped flying, but thanks to you, my passion in space has been reignited. Well, thank you. Thanks for everything. Well, that, I'm, I'm in the same boat, honestly. I, I liked space growing up. I liked the space shuttle, but it didn't really, you know, I grew up with it, but I, I wasn't like, I didn't watch any launches. I watched STS-135. That was the last space shuttle launch. And I literally just sat there. And <laughs> the second it left the pad, I go, ah, oh, crap. You know, I was like, I'm missing out now. Now what? And that literal hole like that, that like, oh no, I, what are we doing now? That's literally was like the start of everyday astronaut. So I'm right there with you. I'm glad that uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff that we can all get together, talk about uh, and be excited about. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of like the next five years in space flight are going to be absolutely incredible. I can't even wait. So yeah, I think it's going to be really hard not to be excited. And I'm excited to help everyone understand why they should be excited. So, yeah. So, thank you. Um, Francis, just received your Buran t-shirt. You love it. Well, awesome. Thank you. Um, yes, I, we already shipped, I think, almost all of the Apollo 8 shirts already, too. The store is getting better and better. You know, new shirts all the time on everydayastronaut.com slash shops. And I'll be dropping some new exclusive shirts here really soon. A really special limited edition shirt coming out in the next probably week or two. So stay tuned. Um, I'll let you guys know. We also got Gridfin Nauta Coasters back in stock finally. Um, yeah, the, they were out of stock for a long, long, long time. Um, but we finally have like, we finally have them in stock. So if you've been wanting to get your Gridfin Nauta Coasters, now's the time to do that. But yeah, new shirts, including this one. And don't forget, if you are, if you work in the aerospace industry, if you work at SpaceX, NASA, if you work for, you know, ULA, whoever you work for, um, Iridium, uh, Rocket Lab, you get 25% off apparel 24-7. All apparel, um, you just click here, um, and then what it does is that you have to send in, you basically just like put in your work email, it'll send you a coupon code, and that's it. And there's no, um, we don't keep you on a list or anything. Um, it's just my thank you to you for working so hard to help influence me and get me excited about space and space flight. So yeah, those are back up. Boom. Um, pretty Pretty excited about that because we had a lot of people asking for those. Um, so thank you, Francis. And Joe, yay landing. Get, get you some Mucinex sinus full force. That's probably a really good idea at this point because I'm just, ugh. Um, Jeffrey Tripp, tomorrow hinted that I'd be on the show. No, this is my, um, this is my one step away from vacation to be able to stream. So I don't have any plans to do uh, another stream on Saturday with tomorrow. But if you guys aren't watching tomorrow, TMRO, you definitely need to do it. Uh, they will have, oh, I know what you're thinking of. It's, it's not me. Uh, Peter Beck is going to be on the show on Saturday. So you guys definitely need to check that out. He is the CEO and founder of Rocket Lab out of New Zealand. He's go, I don't know if he's going to be in studio or if it's just going to be a stream in, but definitely check that out. Um, go to youtube.com slash T-M-R-O. So the letters T, the letter M, the letter R, the letter O, tomorrow. Check that out. They are an awesome, awesome space communication channel. They do a, a weekly show where your comments, every single, every single like comment you do in chat, they can pull up and put into the show. And they've been doing that for years. It's like, I don't, they're so far ahead of anything else. Um, two of the, the, as a matter of fact, it's produced and, and started by the person that produces the webcast we're, the SpaceX webcast we're watching right now. It's the same producer. So um, if you like SpaceX, I think you'll like tomorrow. Um, yeah, they're awesome. So uh, Joshua M, I'm out at Vandenberg Air Force Bork, Vandenberg Air Force Bork, Vandenberg Air Force Base for this launch. Amazing. Vandenberg Air Force was the only place in California not foggy today. That's super lucky. Lucky for all of us trying to watch. That's awesome. Um, congrats on seeing a, a gorgeous launch. It looked like it was picture perfect. Um, and thank you. Ocean Breeze, the launch alarm app told me it was T minus five until launch during the boost back burn. Uh-oh, that's not good. 
It may have been an, oh, that might have been why my, so there's a launch library that's an API that all these apps basically pull from. So there's a chance if that API is off, all of those apps are off. So definitely double check. Uh, that means my web store or my website can be susceptible to that too. Um, yeah, that's kind of scary. Maybe double check SpaceX's thing. Yeah, hmm. Um, let's see, the launch, launch, yeah, Paul, Tim, please show us your hotel room. Uh, we're in a giant, like we rent, it's like 17 friends. We all rented a giant like cabin up here in Breckenridge. Um, I'm not gonna go snowboarding this year. I just, last time when I went, up here in Breckenridge, like the altitude. I don't know what it is about altitude. I just, maybe I need to like be out here a week and then I would like snowboarding a lot better out here. Um, so I'm just gonna lay low, I think, go snowshoeing, maybe get a little relaxing in. Um, it's been, it was a crazy busy uh, winter for me. So I'm looking forward to just like some downtime. Um, so we are in this like huge, huge, huge house to, that can hold 17 people. Um, so it's a lot of fun and I would move the camera around, but I have an adapter that's running my second monitor and if that comes undone, OBS crashes instantly, so let's not do that. Um, otherwise, I would gladly give you a little tour. Um, Harambe's ghost. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Tuba horse, glad I was able to catch the stream before work. The fact that the booster landed was a relief. I know, I, I forget that this is our first launch since CRS-16, isn't it? Or was there an expendable launch? There was an expendable launch, wasn't there? There's that GPS satellite. But our first landing attempt since CRS-16. Um, dang, that's crazy. Um, yeah, I'm glad it went well too. So, um, and Julian, and thank you, Tuba Horse. Julian's lab, there won't be flares with the Iridium Next, unfortunately. Dang it. <laughs> Check sat altitudes on maps. Some are low and will re enter. You work at Copenhagen Suborbitals, by the way. Oh, that's awesome, Julian's lab. I didn't realize that. I've seen your name around here all the time. I, I visited, I don't know if you know this, I visited um, Copenhagen Suborbitals in 20. 15. I, if you guys don't know, I need to do a video on Copenhagen suborbitals because basically it's like a maker space making actual rockets and they're actually trying to launch a human above the Kármán line eventually. It is unbelievable. It's super cool. They're literally using like off the shelf parts that you go get at a hardware store. And I think it's super, super cool. Um, Flipper flop dop. Hi, Tim. I've been a fan for a while. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you, Flipper flop. All right, let's get back to, um, let's check out some of this stuff. Where is this? Uh, no, where's Twitter? Where did Twitter go? <laughs> oh, I know. I had that full screen. Here we go. I'm going to show you guys. So this is, this was not today, obviously. This was them practicing. Let me rewind all the way so you can see this. Already a million views on this. So they, SpaceX has been practicing recovering fairings. Um, they lift them up with a helicopter. They get them out above the target site, and then they drop them. And you'll notice that pretty quickly a parafoil is, is, uh, is deployed right away. And then it basically ends up like sh floating back down. And then this boat, Mr. Steven, has to try to get underneath it. And the boat is really, really, really fast. And despite this, they are yet to be able to recover. Don't forget, this thing is the size of a school. You can fit a city bus inside this fairing. So it's so hard to picture. This just looks like, oh, maybe like the size of a, a bed or something, right? No, this thing is massive. You can literally fit a, fit a city bus in this. It weighs, um, I don't remember, a ton or two. It's, they're pretty heavy. They're carbon fiber. And look how close they got. So um, yeah, on our ludicrous feature, the podcast that I was talking about that you guys need to make sure you're watching, um, we talked about, we were doing a series called Why Don't They Just? And this was the first installment of Why Don't They Just? And the Why Don't They Just? Why don't they use four massive drones? I'm talking like, Drones that can carry 10 people, you know, like, you know, a hexacopter, four of them that d take off from like a drone ship that have a huge net between them, like 10 times bigger than this net or something um, that can go up and meet the fairing. That way it's autonomous. It's, there's, it's crewless. They only need to have enough airtime for like 15, 20 minutes, put it down on Mr. Steven, and then they land themselves. But yeah. You know, I'm sure there's a good reason. Anytime you hear yourself saying, why don't they just, there's probably a really, really good reason. But then again, SpaceX is one to be like, yeah, why don't we just do that? They're probably the most, they're probably the, the company that I've followed the most that if you, you can imagine an engineer walking into a room and going, why don't we just make a giant net on a boat? And then they're like, oh yeah, <laughs> why don't we just do that? And they did. So it wouldn't surprise me if we keep seeing random, random, random things like that. Um, 
yeah, Flipper Flop, you've been a fan for a while. Keep up the work. Well, thank you so much, Flipper Flop and George. We'd love to see a video about the Copenhagen Suborbital Spiker rocket, the first uh, manned amateur rocket to reach the Kármán line. They hope to be the first amateur crewed rocket to reach the Kármán line. Yes, um, that's definitely one I need to do. Um, yeah, and then Flipper, Flipper Flop Doppel, thank you. Um, let me make sure I'm, there we go. The other thing we need to talk about here was the hopper, because Elon was talking a lot about the old hopper. Um, Twitter.com. Why can't I see my tiny little screen? That is, that is the, no, not SpaceX. I want Elon Musk. All right, so Elon was going nuts last night, too, talking about more stuff about the hopper. Um, for instance, he showed off the grasshopper flights, which again, I talked a lot about those in my video, why, SpaceX, why SpaceX's newest rocket won't go to space, which everyone hated, sorry guys. Um, the body at nine meters, um, orbital prototype in June, so the, that's insane. They're talking about having the first orbital prototype. So this is the one that will actually have to have those actuating fin flapper things and real stainless steel balloon tanks instead of just stainless steel cladding um, that's crazy. If they, that's got to be Elon time. I mean, that is insane. Although they did just build a hopper in like five weeks. That's nuts too. I didn't expect that to happen. Um, so yeah, let's keep going through these. There's a lot of good information here. Oh, from this guy, who is this jabroni? Uh, everyday astronaut. Will there be some kind of shock absorbers installed on the feet of the landing legs? Elon, yes. And then he got on a rant of just yeses. Yes. <laughs> What's the what's he responding to here? I don't know. No one knows. Um, he shared um, Evelyn, who has been very active down in Boca Chica slash Brownsville, uh, showing off the rocket. Look at that. That just looks so sci-fi. I can. That's so retro future. Who knew that in the past, like comics and all these like sci-fi ideas of what's going to be in the future ends up being what actually like. Doesn't make any sense, yet it ends up working. I love this. Um, yeah, and he says these are for vertical takeoff and landing tests. Orbital version is taller, has thicker legs, won't wrinkle, 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 and a smoothly curving nose section. So instead of yeah, tink, it'll be totally smooth. Um, yeah, he was talking. There's a lot of stuff. I'm trying to find those where he talks about the. Um, he talked a lot about Tesla the other day, including SpaceX package Tesla that will apparently literally fly because uh, he goes we'll actually do something like this it's a picture of a car flying and i go serious question i know you're planning on copvs and such in the back seat area and some cold gas thrusters but why have thrusters on the bottom when do you want to decrease downforce unless simply to fly and he replies with a winky so now i'm expecting to see cars literally fly which he's like apparently not joking about um, but I'm trying to find where we actually were talking about the radically redesigned Raptors. Oh, then big deal, obviously, is look, we have hardware uh, for Crew Dragon actually out on the pad. And unfortunately, right now, we're basically a one-to-one -one day delay. Uh, every time there's, every day the government shut down the DM-1 mission and any other crew commercial program, except for SLS somehow got funding to keep going, which is not at all critical, in my opinion, compared to DM-1 and OFT-1 with Boeing. I don't know why they got like for long that's a little political we don't need to we don't need to go there but um so we're hoping now for early february um we will see um but yeah i'm super stoked for that i'm trying to find where he says radically redesigned more in a few months aiming for four weeks which probably means eight. Oh, here we go here we go so this is him talking about the engines currently on starship hopper are a blend of raptor development and operational parts but they won't be hopping with these. These are just like literally probably old test stand units. The first hopper engine to be fired is almost finished in California, probably fires next month. And that was on the 5th of January. Um, yeah, I, I've been kind of hearing that they're hoping to get this thing on the stand. And again, this is a radically redesigned Raptor, which I don't honestly know what that means. Um, there's a lot of speculation. So oh, we'll see. I think that's going to be super, 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 super cool. So um, yeah, and then also from uh, Finn uh, Horheen, thank you. Thanks for the great content. How many first stage recoveries have SpaceX done? Um, I think we had that in our pre-launch preview, maybe. Um, so 
33rd landing. They've re recovered 33 of them. They've reflown 19 of them, which is unbelievable. Remember, now they're reflying rockets more than once, so they can ha they'll can they end up be having way more... Wait, how does that work? No. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, and they ended up throwing away a bunch of Block 4s, too, instead of um, trying to recover them again. So, um, yeah, so the reflight number is still below the landing number by quite a bit. And I don't know if that will ever change, right? I don't know. Too much to think about for a Friday morning. Um, <laughs> so let's, let's check in real quick with the webcast. Let's see if we're almost done with this coast phase. This is a long coast phase. It's going over Antarctica right now. Dang, guys. Well, what do you guys want to talk about? I would, I'll love... Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, pretty sure, yeah, uh, Wes uh, Magyar in our, in our Discord channel asks, pretty sure Elon did that design on purpose, the, the retro future vintage thing. I kind of think you're right. I think it's like literally a throwback, total aesthetics. He says he's almost as OCD about aesthetics as Steve Jobs. You're right. It is very beautiful. Um, I can't wait to see that. I'm going to go ahead and do this while we talk here. Um, so... Raptor bells. So yes, there's been some speculation that the potential that Raptor engines could potentially these new ones have a, like basically a kink in them. And what it does is um, it allows for a sea level engine bell basically with a vacuum bell attached to it. But there is a transient period where if you're as you're throttling through that and as the altitude changes, that it could be a really nasty uh, transition. But the interesting thing about using one of those on Starhopper, just like if you were to use one on only like the landing burns for Falcon 9, you're only going to operate that engine in a vacuum or like in before you re-enter and then as a landing burn. So you, it, it would make sense you could actually use a BFS engine uh, to have this dual nozzle effect. Um, and, if, and I don't think there'd be a time when it would be firing in that altitude range. If there is, you could always just throttle it down, it sounds like. So pretty sweet. Um, pretty stinking sweet. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to keep up with you guys here. Any news on Zuma? No, that's old news. I, I'm 99% sure Zuma's up there doing his thing. Um, yeah. Who, who even knows? Um, are the fins on Starship going to be pointy like the ones in the hopper or the ones like in the early renders? Good question, the British Unknown. Um, in our Discord. The, so the hopper is pretty different. It's, it's mostly, you know, basically a flying, um, what's that called? A flying uh, boilerplate, right? So those, those are just completely stationary landing legs. They don't have the same surface area, the same fin surface area as what the actual Starship will have. So I think when we see Starship actually flying, the, the first orbital versions, I think it will be that taller, less spiky version. Um, I'm pretty sure, because I think they just need that much surface area in order to actually do that control. So um, let's see. Uh, Derek should take up skydiving to get used to altitude. No, thanks. Oh, man. I think I would. I, I got super wrecked just trying to do scuba diving for the first time. I was in Huntsville. I was at a doing a thing for Nat Geo's Mars. They wanted me to go to space camp in Huntsville. And I went scuba diving down to like, I don't know, not even 10 meters. And I was so sick for like two days. My head just killed. I think I didn't do it right or something. <laughs> um, so yeah, whoops. Uh, Zane, I've been watching your videos and live streams for a while now on Lever Content. Keep the amazing work and carry on tweeting. Elon, well, thank you, Zane. You know, I definitely found the key is, is asking relevant questions, um, asking or like inserting facts to other people because sometimes if they're wrong facts, he'll come back and correct me, which I think is hilarious. Um, that being said, now that he's clearly aware, like we have a bit of a Twitter back and forth. Um, I think once he's, once he's ready for, um, to do the Starship like announcement and stuff, after he does that, Let's really try um, on Twitter to get him to do a sit-down interview. I think we could have a really, really, really good conversation um, about things that he doesn't talk about. I, and I've totally realized, I've, you know, I've, like the psychology of, of Elon Musk, he loves 
interviews where he, where it's not like question, question, question. He loves it when he can ramble, when he can just kind of go on. And th- I think that's what all of us space enthusiasts really want is a time for Elon to, to just like nerd out over what they're doing at SpaceX. I don't think he actually gets that opportunity too often. Um, so I think that'd be awesome. Um, I, I'm, I won't stop pursuing that, but I, I'm definitely like making sure it's in the right context. So uh, Retro, what do you think comes after BFR Starship? I think they'll be Eventually, I know they still want to do that 12 meter diameter version. I think this is just the first version. Um, and we're going to see, I mean, 12 meter diameter ship is going to be insane. You know, I think we're talking about something that's like 150 meters tall or something when that thing ends up flying. I think they still want to do that because once they prove the technology and the, the, you know, the system, you could easily scale, not easily, just scale it up to make a rocket. Um, but you can, it is easier to scale up once they prove the technologies, once the stainless steel system, active cooled stainless steel, and the Raptor engines are all going, that reentry profile, all that stuff, once it's all sorted out, um, it might make sense to scale up. If they're serious about going to Mars, they'll probably do that. Um, because that's really about the only way you can get a significant payload to Mars. So, yeah. Um, so thank you, um, thank you, Retro. Um, tuba horse. What about extending vacuum nozzles like on RL-10B? So the RL-10B-2 had an extending vacuum nozzle that was used on the Delta III. We talked about that. I have this video um, canceled part two. Um, I have a canceled series that I'm still working on. It's not canceled yet. <laughs> uh, canceled part two is uh, we featured the RL-10B-2, which was in the Delta III rocket that only flew three times. And the extending nozzle on it, they literally have like that's not necessarily to go from sea level to vacuum. That's just to make it so that the vacuum nozzle doesn't take up a huge interstate. So you can cut down on the interstate. And it'd be a really interesting engineering trade-off to see, you know, how much weight does that extending nozzle system put in versus the weight of a taller uh, interstate. Really, is all you're saving. You're saving the weight of the of a extended interstate for a long vacuum nozzle. And I'm guessing the engineering trade-off maybe wasn't worth it because I, we don't see any more extending nozzles, really. Um, they, you can, I think you could use that to make it like more sea level viable and more vacuum viable, um, but no one's doing it. Whenever there's, whenever there's a system that no one's doing, it's typically just not worth it. You know, you almost have to look at like, you know, why aren't there aerospikes? Aerospikes make sense on paper, but when you actually get down to it, are they actually any better than a dedicated sea level engine and a dedicated um, uh, you know, vacuum engine? And the answer is no. They, they don't perform as well as a sea level engine at sea level, and they don't perform as well as a vacuum engine in a vacuum. Um, and they're heavy because they, you know, that, that's basically, that, the spike on them is like really heavy. It has to be actively cooled really well because it's you know, taking a lot of punishment. Anytime you see something like, like, well, why don't they just do that? It's the classic, why don't they just? And aerospikes um, is great. I'm, I'm guessing the extending vacuum engines is another one. It's just like, maybe it's just not worth it. Not worth the engineering, not worth the risk of having, you know, what if that thing fails on extension? Yeah, engineering trade-offs. Rockets are just like photography. As a photographer, I, I always would teach people that, ro- that photography is a compromise. Um, you can, no matter what, you change one variable and you're, boop, boop, just changing another variable back and forth. And it's all about finding those diverging paths of like, this makes the most sense here, this makes the most sense here, and engineering around that. And it's, it's interesting that despite the physics being the same, around the world for every company, everyone ends up with a slightly different design language and a slightly different way to do the same thing. I think that's really cool. Um, yeah. So let's see. Uh, Steven, sorry, love the content. Is it possible? Uh, if it is possible, would you be open to discussing how art impacts the space industry? I'm a tech illustrator at Space Systems Laurel. Steven, that's awesome. Um, I think you know, maybe, maybe not everyone knows this, but you know, Everyday Astronaut started as an art project. It was me as a photographer going around with a spacesuit, taking whimsical and ridiculous pictures of myself, literally with like a self timer and photoshopping myself into ridiculous like situations, right? And as an artist, that was my way to express. Uh, everything, my love for space, my, my especially newfound love for space. Uh, it was a way for me to, um, you know, bring pleasure to the people that do stuff like that. Here, let's, let's go down a trip down memory lane. Instagram. This is old school. Everyday astronaut. 
Um, what? Oh, maybe it would help if I spelled stuff right. Sorry, I'm like on the floor in the middle of Colorado. There we go. So, um, you know, it, the Instagram itself changed a little bit, but for a long time, it was only um, dedicated pictures that were like about art and space, you know? So this is where science meets art. So this is very important to me because to me, I feel like, you know, adding art to STEM, so, so making it STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and, math, and mathematics, um, because I grew up, I did really bad in school, but I loved art. I loved photography. I loved drawing. I loved, um, you know, Photoshop and stuff like that. So for me, uh, that was my way to express that. My dad was an engineer. He worked at John Deere Tractor Company for almost 35 years, but I didn't do very well, uh, you know, in school. So for me to express the stuff was through art. And I think that's really important because art can inspire, you know, like especially sci-fi and art like that can inspire. Look at what we're seeing now with Starship. It's literally like an old school. It's just crazy to me. It's like we're going backwards. Um, art can inspire engineering and engineering can inspire art. And it's just this beautiful circle. And it doesn't matter which side of the coin you're on. Um, you know, even if you're just, even if you aren't, don't have a talent in anything STEAM related, just being able to cheer for them and get excited. You know, I got really into dad jokes for a while. So the food here is great, but this restaurant is really lacking in atmosphere. Um, man, that was, wow, we're coming up on two years ago. Um, yeah. So this was, this is really how Everyday Astronauts started. Um, this is, you probably have seen this picture. I think this is the profile picture of the page. Um, yeah, this was after, this is literally like two days after, um, Elon and SpaceX announced their actual, you know, BFR for the first time, or at the time it was called the interplanetary transportation system down in Mexico. I went down to that. Um, I came back, I was super stoked. Um, I whipped up this picture. I just think like, I cannot wait to see that fly. I don't know if I'll have a vantage point like that. Um, this picture, I went through a little kick of no Photoshop for a while. Oh, wait, why aren't I doing this big? Sorry, guys. Um, um, yeah, I did a whole series where I did no Photoshop. So this literally, I built a wall. <laughs> uh, there's no Photoshop for this image. This is like straight off the camera. That's my nephew with a, his own little spacesuit. Um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. So to me, like the art stuff matters. Um, and I'm really glad that you are in art and in, at Space Systems Laurel, like the fact that you're actually in the industry but you're producing art, that's like a dream job. So great job. Um, guys, if you are in art or if you're not an artist or whatever, like art is such a cool thing to be able to help inspire engineering and vice versa. Engineering, you guys and scientists, you guys inspire me to make art 24 seven. So thank you. Yeah, that's a little, little mini rant there. Um, let's see, Zane, wait, where was that? Zane Raza, he has replied to me a few times too. He, he, he. Yeah, it's, it's fun when you, get, when you get kind of that groove where I think he actually enjoys a certain set of questions. Um, that's in reference to Elon. James, with all the tech in the world, why do we always lose feed from the landings? Why isn't there a drone filming remotely from the barge? James, great question. I'm, that's a video I'm working on soon. Um, that's actually going to be... Well, tell me this. I planned on calling it... I learned a lesson apparently the other day. I planned on calling it, does SpaceX fake their landings? And I was going to go through all the proof... Um, of including all these clips of footages from people all around the world, um, amateur footage of the same launch, and then showing you know why it cuts out and how it cutting out is actually more proof than anything that it's actually um, really happening. Because I love the idea that like a flat earther would be like, see it cuts out, like they see they just replace the clip. It's like wait wait wait. So you're saying they have the clip and they just are unable to hit camera B or like scene B on their mixing board and they've failed 67 times or whatever, or like 35 times now. They're just like, oh, whoops. Oh, oh no. Oh, which button is it? Someone help me. I don't know how to insert this footage. Help, help. Oh, there it is. B, five seconds later. No, it's because there's a signal dropout. Like it's really fun stuff. Um, yeah, so if you guys think that that is a bad title, let me know. I don't want to piss people off with with potentially, you know, saying things like, I, I, don't, I don't want you to feel like I'm tricking you, you know, like, but I have people ask me, doesn't, I heard SpaceX fakes their landings. Why does this happen? I heard, you know, aren't these landings fake? Like, people ask that all the time. They might be trolls, but I don't want to assume that. I, I would rather assume that that is a question someone has actually had. I've had a lot of people say, like, I know they launch, 
because that makes sense, but I don't believe they land. And so I thought it'd be kind of fun to say, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll tweak it a little bit. Maybe I'll tweak it. Um, um, but the, the real answer is there's so many variables. So the drone can't, you know, you can't take off a drone from the little drone ship or the ASDS and have it transmit signal back to ASDS because in doing so, now you're using that same uplink. So then say you have a drone from people. Now you have to have a drone that can transmit a signal 10 miles away or 16 kilometers away because that's how far the exclusion zone is for crew. And it has to be able to go out, fly, you know, uh, within, first of all, if you don't want to get too close to the rocket with a drone, because you don't want to come in the middle of these operations, basically. Um, and then you have to fly it out there. It has to have like a 30 minute flight time, get the footage, like be able to transmit it back. All the, like, there's so many things. And then you ask like, what about a buoy? You know, what if you run a buoy? Like all these things just are end up, the, the end goal is, okay, now you have three seconds of an, maybe five seconds of un, un, uninterrupted footage. The footage isn't there for us to watch, guys. The footage is there for the engineering teams to, you know, validate landing, make sure, you know, they know if a failure goes wrong so they have stuff to look at. It's not for us to enjoy. The fact that we get to see it at all, we should be super thankful for. Um, I'm okay with them not spending a bunch of their resources on that, but um, yeah. So we'll see. Um, they, they could fix it in post, Robert, um, but the problem is, it's a live stream. And, they, and in post, we normally see like, you know, they'll show us like an, a high quality HD that's internally recorded. They'll upload that stuff later on. So we have great footage of, of landing on a drone ship. And of course, you know, we have uninterrupted footage when they're able to land back at land because we don't have that loss of signal and we can have ground cameras and all these things. So the problem is that it goes over the horizon, um, strangely enough, because the earth is a globe. Um, Riley. Uh, going from the inner to outer nozzle in a dual belt can be sketchy, but if you use a throttle bucket, it would have a transition and it would be fine. You're right, Riley, but also, again, hopefully, maybe they won't even need that if they go with this dual engine, dual nozzle stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, West Major in our Discord does say the last time they did a drone ship landing at Vandenberg was amazing. They showed us the wide angle view. Uh, I don't think you mean the wide angle, the really tell us that was because that was literally right off the coast. They, they had the drone ship like 20 kilometers off the coast. They had a helicopter uh, with a long enough lens to be able to get it. It's not generally affordable to be able to fly a helicopter out 600 kilometers downrange, capture footage, and come back. So um, that, was, that was an exception to the rule. So um, yes, but yeah, so hopefully the, they won't have to even worry about throttling. I'm assuming if they use the dual engine, the dual nozzles, yeah, that'll be fine. So. Um, Tiza, hi Tim. We we have the Starship to get to Mars, but what about infrastructure and other necessities once we get to Mars? I don't know if that's exactly SpaceX's thing. Like they're a launch provider, they're going to be able to provide more down mass to the surface of Mars than like by orders and orders of magnitudes if they actually start getting um, Starship to the surface of Mars. We're talking about capability that is absolutely unparalleled. So. I think they've done their job, and I think it'll be someone else's job to come up with infrastructure, including you know NASA and other space agencies, to come up with habitats, come up with ISRRUs, in situ resource utilization, so you can take and get water off the surface of Mars, get fuel for your methane and all that stuff to refuel. Um, yeah. Let's see. And thank you. Hopefully that answers your questions. Uh, Rudder Authority, I like that name. What do you think we have to look forward to for the, with the 50th anniversary of the moon landing? Events, products, museum galleries? Ooh, I don't know. I've heard of a few things. Um, but I don't know. I, I hope that... Oh, we're coming back into the live stream here, I think. Um, I don't know what exactly we have to look forward to. It's past T plus 50 minutes and 10 seconds since liftoff of the Falcon 9 carrying the 10 Iridium Next satellites. Broadcasting to you today from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, and on the screen, you're getting one of the periodic views we've had as we've been going through the coast phase of one of the Iridium satellites on top of the Falcon second stage. Now, so far today, we had an on-time launch. Weather looked a little iffy, but the ground winds died down. We launched right on time. First stage did a beautiful landing on the drone ship. Second stage has completed one burn 
into the desired parking orbit, we're now preparing for a short relight of the upper stage engine in about a minute from now. Now this second burn is much shorter than the first. It only takes just under four seconds to raise the required iridium orbit to the final altitude. Now the ignition is called SES2, the second stage engine start number two. Then we will have the second stage engine cutoff number two, or SECO2. Now following SECO2, we will then begin deployment of the 10 Iridium Next satellites starting at about T plus 56 minutes and 58 seconds. So just before T plus 57 minutes, we release them one at a time about every 100 seconds. And we'll be bringing you that. But right now, we're going to wait for ignition of the second stage engine coming up in about 15 seconds. Now currently second stage is doing settling pulses, making sure the propellant's at the bottom of the tank, ready to support ignition. There we go. Engine ignition. Nice short burn here, guys. We've had ignition and we've had shutdown. That's it. <clears throat> That's hilarious. All right. Waiting to hear a good call out and we'll and do 10. Like nominal orbit insertion. We have a nominal orbit insertion waiting for the guidance officer to call it out. So the second burn is complete. We've got the Iridium satellites still mounted to Falcon 9 right where we want them into the final orbit. So now we've got about five minutes until the first of the 10 Iridium satellite deployments. There's a view once again looking forward from the second stage camera at the Iridium satellites. We're going to resume commentary at T plus 56 minutes and carry you through the deployment of the 10 Iridium Next satellites. All right, so we've got about three minutes here, guys. Sorry, just getting this set up here. All right, let's get back to a few more questions. Um, so hopefully Rudder Authority, hopefully, I, I don't know, I'm going to have to pay attention to that myself because I honestly don't know um, what we're going to be seeing for the 50th anniversary. Um, I'll have some cool new shirts um, that are Apollo, like, for the whole year. Because, like, this is, like, the 50th anniversary. This is, like, the year of Apollo. Uh, I have a new shirt that's coming out here really soon that I'll be selling all year. It's super cool. Um, I worked with High Frontier Shirts, who makes amazing shirts. So, um, yeah, I can't wait for you guys to see that one. It will be awesome. Uh, GS850, GLZ1982. Sounds like that's an old Suzuki motorcycle. If so, huzzah. Um, thanks for the channel. Thank you for your tip. That's very generous. Uh, I, I love what I do. So I'm just glad you guys are here to, to so I'm not alone. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, Riley, uh, Penne again, Riley Penninger. Um, do I watch Star Trek and or the Orville? Actually, unfortunately, I watch neither. Um, I grew up on Star Wars. But quite frankly, I'm not like it unfortunately sci-fi doesn't really excite me anymore i think we're living in like a new era of like cooler than sci-fi stuff so yeah so I, I unfortunately no i don't but i do like i do like what's his name um the creator of orville and i probably would enjoy that show but i don't know we'll see maybe i'll take one out see how, see how i like it um, Nathan, if I could design your own rocket, what would it look and perform like? More R&D on aerospikes would be a game changer for very atmosphere missions. I'm not a big fan of aerospikes, to be honest. Um, the, the thing is, okay, here's the deal. What I'm learning is like, so often we just think it's easy for us to go bigger is better. We look at a rocket that could lift a hundred ton, ton, 110 tons or something, right? And we're like, that's a better rocket than this one. Like it, what matters most is that your rocket is fulfilling its need. So normally, you know, when you're developing a rocket, for instance, talking with Peter Beck, the CEO of Rocket Lab, when he basically was like, look, we started with a blank slate. We said we want to lift up to 250 kilograms. That's it. That's not a lot. That's not a lot, but that's fulfills, that's the market they were going for. And so they built what I think is the best rocket for that. I mean, that rocket is incredible. It's inexpensive. Um, it's lightweight, it's high performance, it gets exactly what it needs to do. Um, you know, they could probably have built a more capable rocket, but then the price will go up, you know, and, and, and or manufacturing will be more complicated. You know, they made it super simple. And it, I don't know what I would, 
I personally, like, I love the idea personally of a, a almost like not a big dumb rocket like Sea Dragon because I think that's, um, I think we're smarter than that now. I, I think SpaceX building like a massive, massive, fully reusable rocket, even if the payload was only 10 tons to low Earth orbit, if it's fully reusable. We're setting up for perfect. the deployment of the first of the 10 Iridium next satellites in just under one minute from now. Now the camera right now will, is switched back. We're looking at the MVAC D nozzle on the second stage. We're currently passing over the island of Madagascar. We're flying north. We'll pass over the Horn of Africa and then up over uh, Central Europe. We are moving into the Terminator, so the views will be a little difficult. Terminator. We're out of the light of the sun uh, to the most part, and we are also illuminating with a small lens or a small flashlight that's mounted on the second stage. Now we're coming up on separation of the first satellite. You might just see it at the very uh, top of the screen moving uh, through the frame. The Iridium satellites are stacked in two levels. Let's wait for the call out. Spacecraft separation confirmed. There's, there and you can see a little bit of activity. The first of the 10 Iridium next satellites has deployed. As I was starting to say, the Iridium satellites are stacked in two levels. So there are five satellites on a top tier and then five satellites on a bottom tier. So the first five that we release are off of the top. They're farther away from the uh, payload attached fitting camera and not all of them are in the field of view. So some of them we'll get to see, some of them will be out of sight from the camera and we'll only hear the call out. But the good news, satellite number one is separated on its way. We've got nine to go. And we're about a minute away from the second satellite. We'll be back then with the separation. How long do we have to wait now? Man, this is going to be a long stream, guys. Here, I thought I was going to be able to pop on over to vacation already. Looks like we've got about 20 minutes. But how? Sorry, how many minutes did they say in between each separation? I missed that. I'll turn the music down because otherwise I bet you probably can't hear me. Uh, yeah, how long between satellite deployments? It looks like every minute, basically. Maybe every two minutes. Um, okay, so yeah, if I, if I were to build my own rocket, um, I think I would make it fully reusable would be the key. I don't care how much it can get to, like, fully and rapidly reusable would be my key because I, I don't care how much you can get to space. If I'm able to reuse that over and over 100 times, game changing. So that's, that would be my primary goal. Um, payload capacity is completely secondary to me. There goes and the second I was satellite. a little behind on my call there. We have <laughs> confirmation of payload separation. Confirmation it number looks two. Like it was a little bit outside of the field of view of the camera, so we only heard the call out from the avionics engineer. Two down, and eight more to go. All right. These are released every 100 seconds. Commands from the second stage flight computer go to the release system that deploys the Iridium satellites off of the SpaceX built dispenser that's mounted on top of the second stage. Sweet. So we got eight more to go. All right, so thank you, Nathan, by the way. Tuba horse. Uh, would you prefer to live on a Mars colony, moon base, or cloud city on Venus? If none of the above where? I would, the only place I think I'd really consider going right now, um, in like 15 years, if going to the moon is super routine, we have a really well-developed infrastructure and a really safe, reliable vehicle to, to get us there and back, I would consider going to the moon. But Mars, man, that sounds terrible. Like, at least the moon, you still get to see Earth and you're right there, like you have this connection still to home. I cannot imagine being on a completely desolate, like, I, I just, I can't imagine it. I, I don't know what that would be like. Um, yeah, that terrifies me, but so I would personally like to be on the moon if anything, but thank you. Uh, dark mater, where did you find your tie to Saturn five? You are the best and kisses from Switzerland. Thank you, dark mater. I don't remember. I just, I Googled Saturn five tie, I think. And I found it. I probably need to get those in my web store. Don't I? I'll get them in my web store and then I'll let you know <laughs> that they're in my web store. All right. Third one deployed. Also out of field of view of the camera. But they see it on telemetry that the third one deployed successfully. I'll just keep doing it that way. Um, and Sarunas, 
Uh, thanks for all your great content on behalf of Copenhagen Tomorrow's. That's awesome. Would you mind using, uh, us using some of your groovy tracks on our YouTube videos? Um, since you guys are a nonprofit, absolutely. Hold on. We're coming up on Dubai. Uh, we just lost contact, as expected, with Mauritius. So we're handing off. So we may or may not have live video as we come up to this next separation. As we're Mauritius in the middle of the sounds handoff, delicious. Uh, between the African ground stations and the Dubai ground station. Okay, so we'll just have to listen to telemetry for that one because they don't have a downlink. No big deal. Um, yeah, for, for Copenhagen Suborbitals, uh, a nonprofit, I think you guys, it'd be cool to see my music and your guys' stuff. Um, hit me up. Uh, you can shoot me an email, and I'll make sure we have everything you guys need. So thank you. Uh, Julian's Lab, if you visit Copenhagen Civil World again, let's rent a Cessna and do zero-G Mars moon par parabolas. I like that. Um, Air Julian, zero-G. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> and do you think Copenhagen suborbital should fly a flat earther? I kind of agree with that. Sorry, I'm also trying to listen here. <laughs> Thanks, Julian's Lab. I think, he's, I think he said confirm. There it is. Sweet. Sweet. All right. Will Wren, thank you. Uh, Miles Miller, hey. Um, Tim, you said, you said people hated the last video, but I loved it. Still hoping for that Midwest meetup. Miles, I, I will get to it. Speaking of, I think I'm going to be doing a Colorado meetup here on Monday if we end up sticking around Denver on Monday. Um, I let patrons know that that is currently the plan. So if you are a Patreon member and you live in or around Denver, um, stay tuned. I will probably be doing a, a Denver meetup on Monday night. Um, yeah, so fingers crossed. It, we're, we're kind of basing it off weather, basing it off a few other things. My wife and I, we drove out here. So um, yeah, so hopefully we see you there. If you, if you aren't a Patreon member, literally even uh, you can do it once just so you can see where I'm going. I shouldn't have said that, but I don't care. Hey, come, come hang out. Um, let's see. I'm, and I'm glad that you liked the latest video. I really enjoyed it too, personally. I had a lot of fun playing Kerbal. Um, I had a lot of fun digging into the history of Grasshopper and F9. I don't know why people get so triggered by a provocative title. That's completely factual, but whatever. <laughs> people were very upset. So um, do I think, um, and Retro Wanderer wants to know, do I think orbital constructions will happen? Well, I mean, they already have. Like the International Space Station was orbital construction. So yeah, um, they had another deployment here, the fifth one. Five satellites on the upper tier. We now concentrate on the five satellites that are surrounding the dispenser on the lower half of the stack of what was originally 10 Iridium satellites. Now we're down to five to go. Cool. All right, I'll keep that just kind of quiet. I feel like we don't need to be interrupted every time one gets deployed. Um, let's see here. So um, I saw someone ask if there's any sneak peeks into my next videos. Um, if you're in the Discord channel, they are in every, like they hear every sentence before I even, they, they see me scripting. They help me script. They give me feedback on ideas. Um, so they're involved the entire, they get to see like the dialogue cut before I even put graphics and before I put um, like any music or overlays, they just see a straight up dialogue cut of the videos. Um, give me feedback. It's, it's the best thing that's happened to this channel because I think it's my community and thanks to you guys in Discord um, and other Patreons as well. You guys are the reason that my video quality keeps going up and up because you guys are helping me catch factual errors before they go online, which is really important to me. Like as, as a matter of academia, as a matter of getting things right, having people check my work before it goes live is huge. Um, we've caught a lot of bad errors that I'm really happy are not live and stuck on, on YouTube now. Um, and unfortunately, YouTube, if you take a video down and re-upload it, YouTube will like totally, it's, they do not incentivize that. They do not incentivize in any way, shape, or form being pedantic and being correct, um, which is really a shame. So, um, so it is, if, you, if you are interested in that kind of stuff, you know, you come in, hang out on our Discord channel on patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. Um, sign up for our Discord channel. We have a ton of fun. The community is amazing. Um, yeah. 
So I, and back to retro, yes, I do think orbital construction will happen. Um, the ISS is a perfect example. Um, but I don't know if like, I would like to see like raw materials and like space welding. I think that'd be super cool, like space welding robots. Um, I'll look into that for a future video idea. Um, also, thank you, uh, Raj. I, uh, yeah, I realized that like almost immediately. Thank you though. Thank you for your tip and thanks for trying to help. David, Falcon 9 version 1.0 rotated at liftoff. Any reason why? An error. It was, the only, it was not all version 1s. It was literally just the first one. Um, turned, I believe, it was 45 degrees right off the launch pad. Um, it was just a, it was a, an error in programming. It thought it was 45 or 90 degrees off. I think it may have been full 90 degrees off. Um, and it immediately just whoop. And luckily... Luckily, they had the roll control perfectly figured out because if they hadn't done that, if, you know, if their PIDs were wrong, their, their inputs um, and control were wrong on that, we would have probably just seen it like, go out of control right away. And I don't know how SpaceX would have survived. The first launch of Falcon, Falcon 9 version 1 um, kind of needed to go off without a hitch. And luckily, even though it did that little 90 degree turn, it ended up being perfectly fine. Um, so thank you, David. Uh, not Heisenberg landing video dropped out solution 90 or 60 second delay second channel video downlink. Um, you're right. Not, uh, not Heisenberg. That is probably the best solution, but again, really for SpaceX's sake, they don't care. <laughs> I mean, the fact that they're giving us any downlink is great. Um, because you, yes, theoretically they could probably record locally, put it on a like 10 second buffer and then, you know, uplink once it's ready to go and once the rocket's landed. But, I mean, we're just talking about a whole other system when really all that matters to them is being able to actually see uh, and record locally. The, the fact that it streams at all is just a total, you know, blessing for us. So, yeah. Um, that's, I've talked to some people about it for a while and it's basically like, why would we spend, you know, $100,000 or whatever, all these different solutions for something that doesn't really matter to them. But, yeah. So thank you, um, John. Thank you very much, Val, or J. Val. I disagree with the sentiment against the big dumb booster. In a, in a day of computers, simplicity is way underrated. I've seen so many software projects fail because overcomplications. Uh, thank you, Apollo, for the Apollo 8 shirt. Awesome. I'm glad you, you got the Apollo 8 shirt already. That's very good. Um, thank you. And thank you for purchasing that. I can't wait to, for you guys to see the next set of uh, exclusive shirts. They're going to be really cool. Really, really cool. Um, I, yeah, I mean, big dumb boosters, okay, but there's also, I don't know, I, I like the idea of being smart and using modern technology to, to make a, a, a fully reusable spacecraft. I, I think it's cool. The, the idea of it being super simple, though, can lead to, like, hope, you know, potentially high reliability, but I don't know. I could be talked into it the other way. Um, so, Runis, thank you so much. Best wishes from Copenhagen Suborbitals. Well, thank you, guys. Um, that's awesome. And Cliff, keep it up. Thank you. And uh, Bjornar, do you think Gateway Foundation's project is viable to make a large spaceport in low Earth orbit? I don't know enough about Gateway Foundation's project um, to really speak candidly about it. Um, yeah, it takes <laughs> space is expensive, first and foremost. Like it costs money, a lot of money. Um, I would love to see the, you know, to see a a space gateway more than anybody, a giant spaceport in low earth orbit would be amazing. But, um, yeah, I would, I don't know. <laughs> oh, you could, you could ask questions. <laughs> um, normal ejection payload. All right. So we are down to just two more Iridium satellites, everybody. I cannot wait. Oh, yeah, this would be a good one. SB10, underneath it in white letters, this is the ninth one to separate. Uh, the numbering that is stenciled onto the vehicle is different than the order that we separate in. So don't worry when number nine separates <laughs> and you're going, why is it labeled number 10? Here we go. Second to last one. Got a light have separated. Oh, yeah, nice view. <laughs> Satellite number nine has separated. We're down to one to go. Here we go. Nice. 
I can't wait. Last one. Last one, and then it's vacation time. Which for me, I think is going to start with a nap. Since for whatever reason, altitude just ruins me. Thank you guys for, for bearing with the lower quality here. I had to reroute like the whole router in this house to even get anything beyond like a, like two kilobytes or something. Our phones are terrible up here. Um, again, yeah, I am up in Breckenridge, Colorado. So I uh, don't have very good service. We're just in the middle of the mountains right now. Um, and luckily, I stole the router from downstairs, whipped something up real quick. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, and uh, also from Raj again, just curious what happened to all those chunks of frozen oxygen? Would they continue to orbit the Earth like the satellites? So basically, they're going to be orbiting almost in parallel because, you know, they just get ejected and then they end up kind of crossing paths again eventually. Everything in, in orbit basically works in circles. Um, they, w that chunk of oxygen, though, I don't know if it will evaporate or anything. I don't know how that works um, or, or melt or, or something. I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I would like to know more about that, Coming but I'm... about 10 seconds to go. Here we go, 10 seconds. of the 10th satellite on this, the Iridium 8 mission. There we go. Um, but I, I'm guessing that it, the Final stuff would deorbit pretty quickly. And you've heard the call out. Final Iridium satellite separation. And that's not only 10 for 10 today, but that's 75 for 75. It's been a clean sweep for Iridium and Falcon 9. That's going to bring an end to our webcast. And it's been a great webcast. Falcon 9, we had sunrise. We saw the rocket countdown launched right on time. Beautiful views from the onboard cameras. First stage landed on the drone ship right on the X. Second stage went into the first orbit. It was a very nominal orbit. We relit the engine. Second orbit was an excellent one. And just now you've watched with us over the last 15 minutes or so as we've deployed all 10 of the Iridium Next satellites, completing 75 satellites on orbit for the new generation of Iridium capability from space. Now we'd like to thank the United States Air Force for their range support today, and our licensing agency, the Federal Aviation Administration. And a special thanks to our Iridium customer for eight great launches over the past mm -hmm. two years. When Iridium and SpaceX entered this agreement, it was, at the time, the largest single commercial satellite deal ever signed. So it's been exciting to support these launches and a true honor to be Iridium's launch provider. Thanks, Iridium, and thanks to those watching, and have a great day. I love John. Team is conducting the countdown. Sweet. Huh. I don't know what this is. Oh, maybe we should, I'll keep this pulled up. Looks like this is, sweet. That's awesome. I like this footage. I'll probably use it in the future. 75 new satellites in orbit. So people were asking constantly over and over about the second stage. Yes, SpaceX deorbits their second stages. If it's a directed geostationary orbit, um, a direct injection, then they will do, oh, that's so cool. Um, if, it's a, if it's a direct geostationary, they can put it in a graveyard orbit beyond um, where any serviceable satellites really are. But otherwise they deorbit it on purpose. Um, and that deorbit burn is probably happening any any minute, and it'll come back down at, at its lowest um, lowest point. This is a cool video. All these folks from Iridium, it looks like. So cool. I wish I had seen an Iridium launch. I never got to. I should have. So cool. Yeah. So now looks like they uh, they knocked it out of the park. Um, the sound is just, man. The right kind of match. No, oh, it's not really anything. It's just music. That's cool. Super cool. Congrats, SpaceX. Congrats, Iridium. That's super, super awesome. Well, I'm going to go ahead and finish up um, everything that we're doing here. Uh, it looks like I had uh, John wants to know, um, any chance you do a video on Lunar Gateway? Yeah. Oh, I could probably got to get rid of the countdown clock. <laughs> um, any chance to do a video on Lunar Gateway? Uh, I yeah, I'm going to be looking into the Lunar Gateway once it's a little more solidified. Um, I don't like doing if things are too far out. 
I like doing it kind of as the excitement builds and as I learn more and as more information becomes available. Um, yeah, well, thank you for thinking that I do even handed and researched way. I, I appreciate that. I, I try really hard to come, come to like, I, I want to be an, an enthusiastic about all anything going to space. If it's going to space, I want to get excited about it. I want to come like, I want everything just to be like, yes, this is good. You know, I, I'm, I don't want to be like negative about almost anything. Um, so I always look for like the good in all the programs. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that the lunar gateway doesn't disappoint. So tuba horse, the oxygen will sublimate once the sun, sun warms it up. That's awesome. There you go. Now you guys know. Um, thank you guys for bearing with me on the, the lower than normal quality. Um, again, if you guys want, we, like I said, we do have the grid fin nautic coasters back in stock here. Um, and new shirts. Uh, these are some, this is actually one of my favorite shirts now. Um, it's a little nod to ASDS. These are all available on everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Um, these, the shirts are super high quality. They're actually like properly silk screened, um, or screen pressed or whatever it's called. Silk screened. Yeah. And like custom tags and everything. And they're really high end cotton. Um, yeah. So I hope you guys enjoy this new shop. We've had to work a few kinks out. I think we're getting really smooth now. Everything's going really well. Um, Check it out if you haven't been there yet, everydayastronaut.com. Oh, we also have new stickers. You guys were asking, we shipped with this Remove Before Flight sticker that was on the outside of the package. We now include that sticker in the sticker pack, so now you get that as well. Because everyone's like, I want that sticker. It's like, oh yeah, maybe we should include that. So now we have sticker pack 2.0. So if you guys want to do that, please do that. Um, and uh, always remember to check out uh, pre-launch previews. The last thing I want to tell you guys is be sure and go to ourludicrousfuture.com. What is that? Our ludicrous future.com um, or just find our ludicrous future it's spelled uh, ludi ludi kraus i never know how to spell it because i'm a terrible at spelling our ludicrous future is our podcast with ben solens from teslanomics and answers with joe's joe scott um, we just recorded our 16th episode so be sure and subscribe um, we also have a youtube channel if you want to we we do it both in podcast format so you can listen to it wherever but you can also watch it on youtube as well um, I have a lot of fun with these guys. The, hopefully, we're making the show get better and better every episode. So please check it out. Um, thank you guys for bearing with me. Um, oh, yeah, good call the British on and I'll take care of that. Um, but thank you guys for bearing with me for lower quality than normal. Uh, I'll be back in the studio for the next launch, hopefully. And or when I get down to like the Cape or the next time I do a live launch, this is a bit of a testing ground here for me. Um, yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, I really appreciate you sticking around. Be sure and uh, follow me on Twitter and all that stuff. And, you know, all the same things that everyone says at the end of their videos. Um, thanks for all the support. And, of course, thank you for not hating me for a clickbait title. I didn't realize that everyone is going to poop their pants and not be able to handle um, a factual title. But that being said, I'll be sure and be more sensitive to that in the future. So um, I will be at the Cape for Falcon Heavy. I'll be at the Cape for DM1. Um, I'll be at the Cape for probably OFT one. I'm going to be at the Cape a lot this year, I think. So, um, yeah, here we go. Yeah. Time to go enjoy the snow. Thank you guys for, for sticking with me. Um, I hope all of you guys have a fantastic weekend up ahead. I think I will too. I'm going to drink a billion gallons of water so that I can acclimate to the, the altitude well. So, um, oh, and one last, uh, lo uh lukewarm nest, uh, when they decrease power from max Q, what percentage, uh, decrease of maximum thrust is it? It, it isn't obvious the visual uh, that it decreases at all. I don't think it's very much. You know, they might down, they, the throttle bucket might only go down to like, you know, 70% or something. I think the space shuttle, they had to call out, uh, I don't remember what it was. I think it's like 75% of the space shuttle. There's something, it's not a lot. Um, yeah, I don't know if it'd be very noticeable. So, yeah. All right. Um, the Merlin just can throttle from 100 to 70, says John. I think the Merlins can actually go down to, the, there was a debate of they can throttle 30% and people were saying, does that mean they can go down to 30% or throttle 30% saying like 70? I thought it was closer to 60. Um, but yeah, 75% it looks like ish. All right. So thank you guys. Have a fantastic, uh, have a fantastic weekend. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut bringing you snowy footage from Breckenridge, Colorado. Uh, I'm going to go out there and, and play around with some powder. So Thanks, guys. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Bye, guys.